um, given that most of you probably don't know what um, the basis of satellite imagery, I'm going to go over a little bit of that just to give you a little bit of information. <coughs> and um, I'm going to give you a little bit more information on why and how ISIS uses imagery when we started, the type of products we, we deliver, and then we're going to go through a little bit of, uh, of our you know, ISIS imagery briefs, so a little bit of the reports. Most of them, uh, I put up most of the reports that I've written since I've been here, but um, I'll, I also put a couple of the previous ones as well, the big cases. So, um, as you probably know, satellite is commercially available now, but what does that mean? Um, well, first of all, what's a satellite image? Well, a satellite image is pretty much a bunch of data in the form of pixels that satellites deliver to us. But what the satellites do is pretty much explained in all of these drawings put together. So you have a satellite orbiting in space that is pretty much delivering us in pixels the reflected solar radiation. So what happens is that you have the form of, you have your source of energy that reflects in very different ways based on what it's reflecting upon. So it's going to reflect differently when it's reflecting on a building compared to pavement, to the bare soil. Then you have all types of forms of, of grass, of um, you know, forests, you have trees, all types of greenery, you have water, and all of that re reflects in a very different way. And the satellite captures that and then delivers it to us in the form of uh, its data organized in in grids and columns in the form of pixels. So that's what we, we get. Um, commercial satellite imagery became available uh, to all of us, <laughs> us non-government, uh, only at the end of the 90s pretty much. So the whole acquisition process and the use of imagery was pretty much kept very close um, by governments. <clears throat> they did it because most of it was classified, it was most of it a lot of it is um, classified up to, up to today, but that is now based upon the resolution of the image. And on the location of the image, sometimes they will classify stuff. So geographic uh, information system data, so GIS data, is available free, which that, you know, we think we, we were all sort of born pretty much with Google Earth or when we knew how to, you know, use a computer, we knew about Google Earth, but before that it wasn't available. Um, and higher resolution imagery is purchasable now through commercial vendors. So you have, we personally use Digital Globe, we use uh, Airbus that just um, bought out Astrium. So Astrium and Airbus are the same, are the same, Digital Globe bought GOI. And there are some actually new commercial vendors coming along. Um, have you guys ever heard of Skybox? Spy yes. yes, they're, uh, they, um, they're based out of in California, I think they are. Anyway, they're uh, putting into space their project is to put into space a constellation of 26 um, um, optical satellites and uh, they, they are called sky box because they're literally boxes that big. So this is just an example uh, to show you the difference in resolution between really, you know, imagery that was released, well this was only declassified in 1995 but it's an image from 1967. Um, it's a corona image, one of the first um, types of imagery that was available and declassified was from um, corona. And um, on the other hand, you have an October 2007, which is not a super recent, but that's a uh, digital globe. It's probably a worldview one or two image. Um, there's a huge difference in resolution. You guys probably can't see it because of the projector and because you only, you really, really notice the difference in resolution between these two images when you're going to zoom into the image. So if you were sitting at your computer and you had the appropriate software to process this imagery and you had these two images in front of you, if you had to go and zoom in to the center, this would magically become blurry instantaneously. That would actually, you would, you could, the you could go really close and see things quite clearly. So that would actually give you the impression that you're getting close to, closer to the object, um, which is the whole point of higher resolution imagery. So as I said, imagery is now purchasable. Um, so I should specify, when we say uh, there's a distinction between commercial grade and military grade. So up to a few months ago, the distinction was around the half a meter resolution. So anything 50 centimeters and and higher resolution was uh, releasable at the commercial level. Um, anything that was, so what you have is also satellites that are picking up, um, they're collecting data at lower resolution, so under the 50 centimeter marker, but you can sell it at the commercial level if you resample it. So that's what a lot of companies were doing. They were collecting data, for example, at 41 centimeters, and uh, they were resampling it to 50 to be able to sell it to people like us. However, just a couple of months ago, um, the US government uh, decided that they were okay with selling um, higher resolution at the commercial level. 
Um, what the marker is going to be is a little bit unclear. Um, all I know is that Digital Globe is selling me 41 centimeters, which I'm very happy with. Um, yes, um, some people are saying that they will approve up to 25 centimeters. Um, when 25 centimeters up to a couple of days ago was considered military, but um, we shall see what happens. We shall see what happens. Um, what type of imagery is available? So you have panchromatic, multi and hyper hyperspectral, and infrared. Um, these are all bands. So when you buy an image, you have to tell uh, the person you're buying it from, the company, what kind of image you want. Panchromatic, for those of you who don't know, is black and white. Um, multi and hyperspectral are uh, images with multiple layers. So multispectral is at least a three layer. You have three bands to the image, which is the usual blue, red, blue, and green. What we do is we usually buy a multispectral with four bands. So what I do is I buy a three band multispectral and I add an infrared or a near infrared band, which is the NIR band. I'll explain in a little bit what that means. It pretty much means it allows me to do change detection with false color. So it, it gives false colors to uh, different elements so that I can distinguish them uh, easier when I'm doing change detection. And hyperspectral is uh, imagery with multiple, multiple bands. You can go all the way up to like 16 or 18. Um, here we go. This is just a quick chart that I stole from Frank Pabian, who is one of the best imagery analysts out there. Um, I stole a lot of his slides. Thank you, Frank. Um, so this is just a graph showing how, uh, showing all the satellites and the sensors we have. Um, so it's graphing them based on the year they were launched and on the resolution in meters. So you can probably figure out that we're looking at, uh, we analyze imagery, us and most uh, people at the commercial level now are analyzing imagery that goes from here on. Um, it's not super updated. I don't think there's Worldview 3, which Digital Globe just launched, which is a quite amazing satellite. Um, but yeah, it goes all the way to 2012 or 2013. Um, and you do see Skybox on the far right there. Skybox's resolution at the moment isn't that great still, but I mean, they only have two satellites in space. They just launched their second one a couple of months ago. Um, but they do intend to put up a constellation of 26, which means, what does that mean? That means when I go and purchase an image from like Digital Globe or Airbus, I um, you know, uh, based on the number of satellites, that, you know, they only have one picture per week or one picture per three days of a certain area, depending on how the satellite is tasked. A constellation of 26 satellites really helps me because that means they're going to have, they're going to be looking at the full globe multiple times a day. So that means when I go and look for an image, I don't have to wait a week for them to put up a new image. Um, and also remember, all the imagery that's put up is not usually uh, I can't analyze a lot of it. Um, sometimes there's clouds, like when you're looking at India in the monsoon, se monsoon season, well, good luck. You're not going to see through that. You might have to analyze radar uh, imagery, but we don't do that. So uh, a constellation of 26 is going to be is going to be big. We'll, we'll see if they actually do that. So just a brief um, overview of a little bit of a complicated slide that I again stole from Frank, but um, just to show you how the IAEA, for example, uses satellite imagery. Um, they have, uh, they created a very specific small but very, very <laughs> highly qualified uh, satellite uh, analytical unit within the Department of Safeguards and uh, they use um, satellite imagery in very useful ways. For example, they monitor uh, the nuclear fuel cycle, uh, all the activities that take place there, any changes to the fuel cycle. They verify state declarations with satellite imagery which is also very important they help their inspectors so they support all the um, inspection uh, activities that uh, the teams have to do and last but not least which is usually one of the most complicated tasks they try to investigate possible undeclared activities um, we'll talk about that in a little bit um, so why did we start well we started using imagery towards the end of the 90s um, when it became available to, to at the commercial level for people like us um, our first uh, case, uh, big case using uh, imagery was the 1998 Pakistani nuclear test. Um, since then we noticed how you know, big imagery was and how much it helped our analysis, so we started buying it more and more. And what we do is we try to, we publish what we call ISIS imagery briefs, which um, use imagery to better our analysis. Um, they're quite simple products, we try to keep them as simple as we can, um, but what we do is we focus on very specific countries. Um, so we've done a lot of work on in the past on Pakistan, and we still do on Pakistan. We've done some work on Al-Khibar in Syria, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but we do focus mostly on Iran, North Korea, uh, India, Pakistan, and we've been doing some work on China for 
for our worldwide stockpile assessment that we're working on for NTI. Um, so it, I'm going to explain how that helps our, our analysis in that case as well. Um, why do we use imagery? Well, we use imagery because it's a very, very important tool in the field of nuclear non-proliferation. It helps us not only educate public and governments, it allows us to increase awareness. A lot of the public does, you know, it's, it's easier to convey a message when you have an image and you're pointing something out to people. It's easier to explain to the public the nuts and bolts of, nuclear, of, of these of uh, specific nuclear fuel cycles, of the problems related to them, of the risks they pose, and all that stuff. Increases transparency, it allows us to better analysis when we're doing, for example, nuclear weapons um, estimates or when we're doing worldwide stockpile assessments. And we've also used imagery to prove or disprove media claims. We'll get into that a little bit more in, in a while. Um, oh, something very important here is um, you know, our analysis has supported often the findings of the International Atomic Energy Agency and w in what way? Well, we've pretty much helped them uh, build their cases for inspections into very specific sites. So the most notable are Natanz in 2002, which we came out with the imagery for. Um, Parchin today, I'm going to give you some imagery on that. Um, but it's important to notice how we've been sort of helping the agency building their cases for inspections in these sites as well. Um, Oh, this is just related to, uh, in addition to you know, satellite imagery, what I've been working on uh, is our latest worldwide stockpile assessment of HEU, plutonium, americium, and neptunium in, in every country that has them. And uh, it's kind of hard to do these sort of assessments when you're looking at countries from which you can't get a lot of information at the open source level from. So a way for us to help uh, estimate their stock, specifically the HEU ones, more than anything when they have an enrichment fuel cycle, is to use satellite imagery to do that. So. That's very, very important. Uh, this is a very f one slide with a lot of stuff in it, um, just to convey one basic message. Commercial satellite imagery is a very, it's a great tool, a very useful tool, but rarely is it useful by itself. In very few cases, it's useful by, by itself. If I need an image just to find out if there is a building in a location, okay, I might be able to, to come up with the, the answer to that question just with an image. But when you're trying to do a more integrated analysis and trying to understand things that are a little bit more complicated, you're going to need satellite image imagery, and you're going to have to integrate it with a lot of other type of, uh, a lot of information coming from other sources. So you're not only going to have uh, information coming from member states via safeguards reports from the IAEA and, and what states decide to declare voluntarily, for example, to the IAEA. You're also going to have you know, reports from media. You're going to have to integrate that with, with information coming from social networks, from NGO databases, which, believe it or not, do have a lot of information on this stuff, and open source. So, what I was trying to say with this slide, I'm not sure if I'm successful, <laughs> is a lot of people believe that once you buy an image, uh, you call Digital Globe, you get your image in, you open it with whatever your software is, you magically can figure out everything. You actually can't. Um, there's a lot of, there's t at least two other steps that you need in order to, to successfully make use of the image you, you just bought. Um, first, and one of the most important steps, you need to be able to process and mani manipulate your image. Um, the imagery you buy from the commercial vendors is raw imagery, it's raw data. You need specific software to be able to open it. We use, uh, well, the two basic um, or the most famous are Airdas Imagine and MV. We use Airdas. Um, you need to be able to have, you need the software because you need to be able to work with the bands. Um, Bands are, lay think of them as layers, and you need to be able to work with those. You need to be able to know how to adjust breakpoints, look at whatever you're trying to look at, for example, a building from different look angles. There's a lot of processing that you need to do in order to come up with an image that actually allows you to run the analysis on. For example, software, I just put this up to make you guys um, realize how much it is. Um, I have this one, <laughs> but we were thinking about the professional, but at the end of the day, that's really expensive, so we try to, you know, do what we can. Um, it's a pretty, it's very good software, um, uh, but trust me, figuring out how it works is not that easy. Um, this is an image. This is a digital globe, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, uh, image of Parchin. It's only a piece of the of the Parchin site, and um, it is a multispectral four band, so it has a near infrared band. 
Um, and the reason why we buy four layers, so the near infrared band I was talking about before, is so that we can do false color analysis, which means the near infrared detects um, certain waves of heat. So what it does, is it, it, it uh, assigns, for example, all vegetation is in red and all the shades of red. So for example, this you can use it when you're looking at, if you're using imagery to uh, look at crops, you can use the near infrared band to look at what crops, um, the difference between water sources and what crops are watered better and which ones aren't. In this case, for our purposes, I need to be able to distinguish vegetation easily because vegetation sometimes gets very confused with if you have a building that's surrounded by very tall trees or dark vegetation and the building has a darker color, it's often hard to distinguish. Or what in some cases, I'm not gonna name names, they, you know, some, some, sometimes you'll find tarps and they'll put these tarps up on purpose for you to not see, for example, tunnel entrances or whatever they are unloading from a truck into the tunnel. Um, but the near infrared band, so the false color, allows you to distinguish those things much better. Um, as I said, you have a bunch of raw data, and on top of that data, you have to pretty much uh, you have to add uh, your interpretation, so your analysis. So, what is imagery analysis? Imagery analysis is pretty much this is a definition that I got from Frank. Um, it's the process of pretty much deriving labels and determining their significance and their importance. And how do you do that? So. Let's say, for example, we're trying to look for a nuclear site, a new nuclear site. We're doing what we call a wide area search. So you're going to adopt at least one of two strategies. These are the two biggest ones, and then there's a lot of others. But you're going to either try to recognize directly the site, or you're going to try to infer it from elements that surround the site. So for example, direct recognition. If you're looking for a nuclear reactor, you're going to look for some sort of dome, although we all know that they're not always, they don't always have a dome, but you know, if you see a dome um, and you see a bunch of cooling towers beside it, then you can say, okay, well, let me look at the site a little bit better. If you don't see any of that, you have to look at all the elements that are around uh, the area. So you're looking for uh, highly guarded security fences. You're looking at, you know, build the very specific types of buildings. So if you're looking for enrichment halls, some sort of enrichment place you're looking for um, not too tall but very long and usually rectangular shaped buildings. You're looking for differences in vegetation. You're looking for sites that are not in the center of a main city but not even too far from a main road so that you know aren't too difficult to get to. There's a whole bunch of things that you're looking for. This is an example of direct recognition. So this is Chasma in Pakistan. This is a digital globe image from December 2013. So when I, you know, if, if I were to get an image from a place that I didn't know and I saw this, well, I could say, well, I, I know what that is. So that's direct recognition. Um, another half, well, it's sort of direct recognition because it has a very distinctive signature, but also you have to infer it from the surroundings is, um, this is a rock, this is a heavy water production plant. Um, heavy water production plants are quite easy usually to distinguish because they have one signature that very few other plants, if any, have, which are these um, the heavy water towers. But if you look at this image as well, you're going to see um, you're going to see the fencing. You're going to see a lot of support area, um, a lot of buildings in the support area. So there's a lot of other uh, elements that can help you in your analysis there. Um, Imager interpretation, again, according to Frank, is pretty much, you have to look at the five S's usually, uh, which are very, very important. I already mentioned a couple of them, like you know, the size, you have to look at sizes. Everything, you have to also be aware of the scale of the imagery. So you have to look at the size of buildings compared to other buildings. When you're comparing, I often find myself comparing one building and two different images with two different dates. You have to uh, be aware of the inclination at which the image was taken in the satellite. Uh, shadows look different based on, you know, at what point in the day the image was taken and all that stuff. You're looking at shapes. You're looking for you know, objects that have uh, you know, uh, very distinctive shapes. Um, shadows. Shadows can be helpful. I'll show you an example of when they're helpful. But shadows can also really complicate your analysis. Um, as I said, shadows depend on um, the sun angle, the angle at which um, the image was taken, and all that stuff. 
uh, shades, you're looking for different colors of different tones of, you know, the co you're looking at contrast between even reds. As I said before, the NIR band puts everything in red, but you have different tones of red. So you've got to look at those two, and each tone has a different meaning. And then you're always looking at the surrounding objects for context. However, for nuclear nonproliferation, proliferation purposes, you have to also look for very specific signatures. So, for example, as I said before, cooling towers, large ventilation systems, um, those are, that's a very good signature. You're going to always want some sort of cooling area. So you're going to look for water ponds, you're going to look for rivers. If you're in the case of a reactor, it has to discharge or it has to have a cooling system. So you're looking for some source of water. You're looking in enrichment cases, you're looking for long rectangular buildings, um, domes in the case of reactors. These are all very heavily secured perimeters. These are all very good signatures. Um, and at the same time, in order to do your analysis, you're looking at temporal changes. Um, looking at a site on one day is usually not going to get you anywhere. You have to look at that site in time. So that's why uh, Google Earth and um, other, other, other things like that are very, very useful because they usually have a lot of imagery. So you know the image tool on Google Earth where you search and then you can drag the timeline yeah. essentially? Do the sites that you buy the images from, do they have something like that built in so you can kind of Look at it over time, oh, or yeah. Do you have to order each. Image okay, so so when I that? when I go and purchase an image, let's say Digital Globe, um, I put in all the coordinates of the image, the type of image I want, and all those details. And what it does is it pulls up all of the imagery that they have in the archives since that satellite went up. So I can go back years, um, and what I can see there is I am only able to see the previews. Um, so based on the preview, based on all the other data that I have uh, from the image, so cloud cover, incident angle, and all that stuff, I usually have to call it, call, you know, I have to determine whether or not that's going to be a good image. Um, and then only a, like two days later do we actually get the image uh, in. Um, so you can only see the previews, but yes, you can see the previews of all the imagery that's available in the archive for that satellite. In that, actually, no, it gives you multi, uh, all the satellites it has, um, but with those coordinates. Yeah, yeah. So Digital Globe gives me gives me a lot of them. Um, these are just sort of a. I tried to list um, some of the signatures, as you can see. Uh, you know, some of them have none. Um, and some of them are, you know, uh, those are the chances of detecting them is most of them are very low to some of them are medium. Um, it's hard finding a, a site that has not been identified before. Um, with these couple of slides, I just wanted to highlight also something else. Um, so using imagery for nuclear nonproliferation purposes really uh, banks on you pulling expertise in from two different groups of people. You have nuclear experts and then you have imagery experts. And for, according to my knowledge, there isn't a degree out there that teaches you, that puts you in that center box. So what happens is you have to, usually you become, an, you, you know, you end up there because you are either a nuclear expert and you start using imagery slowly, slowly, you start learning all the processing activities and the manipulation of the imagery, or you're an imagery analyst with a GIS degree and then you start looking at nuclear signatures. So what the IAEA often does is they hire, they hire imagery analysts and then they teach them the nuclear signatures. But then other organizations like us, well we pull in nuclear people and then we teach them how to process the imagery. Um, Difference with government. So governments, what they do is they usually acquire imagery. They have their uh, imagery analysts. And then if they're looking at something nuclear related, then they'll pull in you know, any sort of nuclear expert they need. We sort of, well, we acquire the image, but then we're kind of, kind of working backwards here sometimes. We have uh, you know, nuclear experts look at uh, the image, and then we seek the help of um, uh, uh, imagery analysts when, when needed, which we do, which we do quite often. Um, but why is that important? Like, why is it important that groups like us do this as well? Because groups like us, um, what we do is we bring something a little bit different to the table, which is an integrated product. Um, groups, um, 
you don't necessarily have to be an imagery processing expert, but if you have all of this information, we have general and state-specific um, nuclear fuel cycle knowledge. We know the history behind um, each nation's nuclear program. We do, we integrate all of our satellite imagery um, analysis with not only all that information, but all the um, analysis we do on trading schemes and illicit nuclear procurement. And then we deliver a product. So um, that's, that's usually quite useful. Um, what I was trying to say here was simply um, the anal analytical part of doing imagery analysis is probably the most important because imagery by itself, as I said before, is rarely useful by itself. It has to be integrated with other sorts of other forms of information, but imagery by itself can also be quite deceiving. So this is easily recognizable. What's on the right hand side? Yeah, but if you didn't know it, yeah. what is that? You're trying, to, you're trying to figure out what that object is based on its shadow. So it's not, you're not directly recognizing it if you're not familiar with the, with the area. So that can be one sort of deception. You can make really bad mistakes with imagery. We're not gonna go into this at all, but you can make mistakes. And <laughs> who knows what, which one is the al Kibar reactor in Syria? Mm-hmm, absolutely. Um, these are ground images. They all look very similar. What am I looking at, though? There's one difference. This is a 45 meter, meter width. Yeah. That's 12.5. But in a ground image, they look the same. So that's a problem. Another problem. So this is um, a briefing. Uh, IAEA inspector uh, briefing the Egyptian national television claiming that this was analysis of an analysis to scale of the Syrian al Kibar reactor and the 5 megawatt Yongbyon reactor in North Korea. Why, are, why is he comparing it? He's comparing it because when the Syrian al Kibar reactor became an issue, um, it was uh, at the open source level, there was a lot of information about ties between North Korea and Syria. And a lot of experts in the field had actually compared the two and said mm -hmm. they look quite similar. Um, in this, this is um, an analysis that is declared to be to scale. Thanks to Frank, we know it's actually not to scale. This is to scale, which is a little bit different. So in this case, you're looking at the width now matches up a little bit, but m many of you would, are probably saying, okay, but you know, there's a huge difference in height. Well, yeah, that's why you need nuclear experts to tell you that half of it was underground. So that's why imagery by itself is not, uh, usually it, it helps when you integrate it with other sorts of information. And that's why you need imagery analysts and you need nuclear experts to work together. And we all know <laughs> that Photoshop can be a problem, um, especially in media. So this is a 2008 Iranian missile, missile launch. This is the original. This is the Photoshop version. And I have to give it to Frank, he makes a very good point. Uh, you could go <laughs> all the way. Uh, I mean, so you have to be careful of, what, of what's out there. Um, on to what uh, we've done with imagery. So it's just a, a couple of examples of some um, sites, but I tried to pick the nicest imagery so you guys could, could have a chance to look at it. Are there any questions up to now? No? Okay. So Parchin, you're probably aware that we look at Parchin a lot. Um, we started looking at Parchin around, uh, yeah, this is an, uh, we started looking at it in 2012, I think it was. Um, so this is an image. The, the importance of the comparison between these two images is that this is a 2011, December 2011 image uh, taken before the IAEA uh, asked Iran to inspect this very specific site within the Parchin military complex. Um, Iran said no, and that's what the site, uh, they immediately started working and paving and um, asphalting and uh, needless to say, if 
the IAEA were ever to be able to get into that site, um, it would have a really hard time with any sort of environmental sampling because they've modified the site so much. We've been looking at Parchin ever since. Um, this is a really nicely processed uh, 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 image of the site. Um, it's a different look angle. Um, a lot of people were saying that there wasn't actually a protective berm, but there is. So it's just a really good image. Um, we, uh, so um, this is a January, January 30th, 2014 image. Uh, the date is important because it's an image that I, I looked at. Uh, just before the February 2014 IAEA safeguards report that came out and uh, stated that there was some sort of activity, the um, IAEA satellite imagery unit had detected some activity at the Parchin um, site in question. Um, and we had noticed that as well. Um, April 2014, activity continues. And uh, what seems to be happening is that those, all that activity is consistent with the refurbishment or replacement of one of the main walls of the center building over there. Although there, else, there is something happening to the building up there. We don't really know the use of the building out there. We don't know anything, but something's, something's going on for sure. Um, this is August 2014 when there are still, there is some activity, but it's mostly like uh, dirt and water runoff. Um, not too much construction going on, not as much as, at least as before. And this is an important image that we just put in our analysis of the safeguards report that came out the other day because it shows that there's pretty much only uh, debris and water runoff. Um, there's not much going on. In fact, the IAEA safeguards report from November 7th stated that the activity that had been detected previously had uh, ceased. So. That's uh, one site. Um, this is always Parchin, the military complex. It actually, it's a huge site. It goes all the way down here. Um, you might have noticed that there was an explosion at Parchin, or at least an alleged, alleged explosion at Parchin. And uh, we went looking for it, and we found it, and it's all the way down here. Um, that is a bigger version of it. What happened was, I don't want to step in front of the PowerPoint. Um, there was a main building. Here, I'll try to step in front of it. This is the main explosion area. That building exploded. Everything caught on fire, took out four buildings. Fiery debris was probably launched all the way over there to that green area that caught on fire and ruined those buildings as well. So that was the site, but it was, it was actually quite hard to find because um, it's, it's, you don't just open an image and you're like, oh, that's where the explosion is, unless it's an explosion that took out you know, <laughs> um, in this case, it was one building that exploded and caused a fire. It was actually quite, uh, it took us hours to find. Fordo in Iran. I'm just showing you this picture because I really like it. <laughs> um, but uh, we do look at Fordo once in a while, not as often as, you know, uh, other sites because it's an underground facility. So this is a case in which imagery can maybe be useful if there's activities going on outside, but you're not going to really see anything, any, anything happening within. RMP, yep. Um, I guess, what is the process for you guys deciding what, like, what the right time is to buy an image? So hmm. obviously, like, you know, Parchin, I think, is like fairly self-explanatory, the process of like getting ahead of you guys obviously knowing that things are coming up and you want to analyze at certain time periods, but for instance, like, you know, a facility in Pakistan where there might not necessarily be anything in the news or anything that you know is coming up, or yep. how do you guys make that determination? Um, that's a really good question. And it, is it, exp I'm sure each image by itself is quite expensive. Yes. Yeah, so I, I actually didn't put any of that information in here. So for the expensive part, that's usually, that's the main problem here. Um, we're small. Our budget is small. Yeah. And there's only, we have to select what we're going to purchase. Um, every image you have to buy, unfortunately, you have to buy. Most of these sites, I would only need like five square kilometers, but I'm forced to buy a minimum AOI of 25 square kilometers. And in some cases, when you're looking at Yongbyon, for example, I have to buy a much bigger one because the Yongbyon site is huge. Um, on average, each image it goes, well, it depends on the date, it depends, so it depends on how recent the image is, how many square kilometers, but on average an image goes between uh, 600 to to $1,000. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so how do we determine what to follow? So obviously we have a list of, you know, we follow Iran and North Korea more than anything else at the moment. And um, that is also because it's pretty much uh, me and David doing the imager. That's it. Um, so we focus mostly on that. Um, we do decide to purchase um, once every, uh, we, we look at how, I do go through, I constantly check um, what imagery is up on the commercial vendors' websites uh, for countries. So um, whenever I see that there's a series of images coming out one after the other, what does that mean? That gives me an indication that someone's looking at that specific site. So either we go and buy an image of, when I'm looking at you know, India and Pakistan, for example, when do I buy an image for that? I buy it when either I see that there's information at the open source level that tells me that something's going on. In fact, I'll show you after an image about that. Um, or I notice that a lot of imagery is being posted on Digital Globe's website. What does that mean? That means that someone is either tasking the satellite or someone is just purchasing a lot of it. And they, make, they release that in the archives, and that allows me to see someone's looking at that very specific area. So that's also how we make a determination on when to buy imagery. So it's based upon our time, uh, the, the interest that is, you know, Parchin obviously, and, you know, Young Beyond, and uh, you, we, we check those more often. Um, and uh, for every other, for example, we've been doing work on China, but we're doing work on China for the NTI project. So uh, it's, we've never sort of done imagery or a lot of imagery on China before that. So if we have a project that requires it, we'll, we'll do that. Um, or we'll just uh, wait for open source. So for example, North Korea, when there was all that information about North Korea possibly testing uh, again, um, you know, we had, I had interns working on looking through all the open source information and every time there was something new that came out at the open source level then I would go and I would purchase an image. So uh, at one, mo one point in time, I forget when it was, like 2005 I think it was, we started looking seriously at India and we wanted to find uh, the main enrichment plant. And we did. How did we find that? Through tenders. Uh, Bark um, was issuing tenders and there was, we found information in there that led us to a certain area. We went looking for it and we found the RMP, their primary uh, one and only at the moment. They are technically building another one, but this is their enrichment plant. Um, so what we did was we um, started monitoring it, um, all the development. This is 2011. Um, this is the main enrichment building, um, but they did start a lot of construction down here for another enrichment building because, because uh, we all know that India needs more enriched uranium for what? subs. It's subs. Um, although we don't, com they could be, you know, potentially wanting HEU for thermonuclear weapons, but it's mostly for, to fuel their nuclear submarines. So we started looking at the RMP. What did I do? This is an image from 2012. So we monitor the construction and everything that's going on. And this is why the RMP is a really good example of how we use satellite imagery to help us in our estimates, in our stockpile assessments. So this is producing HEU. They've constructed this huge new building. And based on size and estimates of uh, what we knew about the centrifuges uh, in the old building, we're able to come to a, an approximation of what their um, stockpile uh, looks like or potentially look like in the future. And there should be another image. Whoopsie. Sorry. 2013. Uh, this is what it looks like. There's a huge expansion on that side. But we also know, do I have this right after? No. Um, okay, that's pretty much it for this image. Young Beyond, to your question. So we look at Young Beyond a lot, and uh, you're absolutely like, there's moment, moments in time in which um, it's, uh, satellite imagery is useful. There's other moments in time, for example, I'm just going to go one ahead where we continue, even if the LWR is fully constructed, so this, for who of you who don't know, this is a five megawatt reactor right here. The LWR is right under it. Um, once, satellite imagery is very useful until <laughs> the dome isn't on top of it, so you can sort of look inside, you can do a lot of estimates. Once everything is closed and you're trying to figure out what's happening in buildings, that's where everything gets tricky and very hard. And the signatures are very few. So. This is Young Beyond, that's a close-up of it. That's the LWR, which according to what 
we know and others know should not be active yet. The five megawatt is. A year ago, we noticed steam and uh, uh, water being discharged from the discharge pipeline, which is that little teeny tiny dot right over here. Those are the only two signatures that we, can, we are able to see through satellite imagery that tell us whether or not the reactor is active or not. We don't know if it's continuously active. We don't know if they're turning it on and off for tests. We don't know any of that. But those are the only two things that we, we can see with a satellite image. We haven't seen any of those signatures from the LWR yet. But it becomes tricky, directly to your point, when, for example, the latest imagery we bought from September and from September, it's, yeah, I only put one of them, okay. September uh, 2014, okay, this is August. As I said, there's no discharge water here. This is September, there's no discharge water there. After a pretty much a year or slightly less than a year of operation, we don't know if it's continuous or not, but of operation, there's no discharge water and we haven't seen, seen steam coming out of the turbine building that's right beside the five megawatt reactor. So you're absolutely right. We're only looking at two signatures. That's pretty much all we have to determine whether or not a reactor is operational or not. We've gotten a lot of criticism lately, <laughs> especially from the South Korean government, uh, when we came out with our analysis stating that there was some, that the five megawatt reactor was uh, totally or partially shut down. Um, reactors have to cool in some way or another, so unless they found another way of cooling the reactor, the reactor has to be shut down or you would see discharge from the discharge pipeline. But you're right. There's only, there's once, you know, the cap goes on to the reactor, there's very few signatures that you can look at to, to do your analysis. So for like enrichment, for example, like you said, like you can judge based on what you know about parameters of equipment and size of facility, you can judge capability, yeah. but not necessarily for like what is actually operating. Unless you have more information from the ground. No. Okay. No, no. Absolutely not. Um, to that point, on the right hand side, um, same image, same date, because what I do is I buy a gigantic image of the whole Yongbyon site. We monitor also the enrichment facility at Yongbyon. It's the one over there. Um, we've, noticed, uh, we've noticed a lot of activity at the enrichment site. So a couple of years ago, they completely redid the roof on their enrichment hall. And we know that's the enrichment hall because when they were doing inspections there, that was where they were. So we know that. The problem is after North Korea kicked out the inspectors, we have no on, you know, information coming from any of those sources anymore. But what they've been doing is they've been working on a hall right beside it over here. So we don't know whether or not that's related to the main centrifuge hall. We shall see. But they've been focusing a lot of their activities on um, re refurbishing roofs and stuff like that at the enrichment site and less activity at the LWR which we don't know why that's happening. We don't know if they're losing interest in the LWR, uh, if they're not able to operate it properly. Um, we don't know, we really don't know. So those are the limitations. That's why you can't use it by itself usually. Kushab, um, one of my favorite sites, um, just because it's pretty to look at most of the time. <laughs> this is uh, Kushab in Pakistan. Um, this is the uh, heavy water production plant that's their first heavy water reactor. As you can see, the signatures for that are quite distinctive. You have the classic dome. You have all the way to the far right hand side cooling, a uh, cooling system. You have a stack. Those are nice signatures you want to see when you're trying to look for a place. Um, and then you have different kind, but always heavy water reactors, two, three, and four. This was completed recently, a year ago. But they are all identical. So that's one identical signature for all three of them, which is often quite useful. Hungary and North Korea. So when, North, when there was you know, reports of North Korea possibly testing again, we started looking at, uh, we don't monitor Hungary as much as, uh, we only um, go looking for imagery when uh, we see uh, that there's information talking about a potential new, new test or something like that. So this is the location. That's the east portal that is now shut down. And the two active portals, or what we think are active portals, where we saw some sort of activity, are the south portal and the west portal. Um, this is analysis done a couple of years ago from Robert, the guy before me. Um, 
So we, he did some analysis of the cabling that leads right into the tunnels, which is quite interesting to do. Um, and these are just some images of that, um, that I did uh, when we were looking at whether or not they were going to be testing. What happened was we were buying one image every day and we were doing the analysis of it and looking for movement of containers. Uh, we were looking at um, the main support area and any sort of movement at the main support area. And you're looking at um, activity at the two portals. So you're looking for containers, you're looking for, sometimes if the image is good, you can actually see people. Um, you're looking for how heavily the roads are being used. Um, at one point, where's the, ah, there was a tarp or what we thought was a tarp or some sort of concealment uh, put in front of one of the tunnels. But um, we weren't able to get the NIR band for these images, which was kind of a problem for the analysis, yeah. So, um, yeah, and the resolution isn't as, ha as, as good as I would have liked it because when you're looking, when you're monitoring a site like this every day, you pretty much have to buy whatever comes up. And Digital Globe also has QuickBird and Econos images, which are 62 centimeters and 82 centimeters, which are sort of, the resolution is a lot worse than the 50 centimeter. So that's just our work on that. And another type of search. So when you're trying to look for a site that hasn't been identified yet at the open source level, obviously, um, <coughs> we call those wide area searches. And again, to your point, we can't do a lot of those. There are a lot of locations that we would like to explore and go and look for things. And we might even have open source information on, but um, it's a lot of money to do a wide area search. Um, once upon a time, we used to get free imagery from Digital Globe, but then they sort of took a commercial turn. And you know, if that's the price for all the imagery, sometimes we're looking at endless kilometers worth of imagery to look through, um, and that's just you know economically infeasible. But um, we have done some pretty good work on some wide area searches. Um, the case of Al Kibar in Syria was the best one. Um, even if a lot of people speculate we got classified information, we didn't. Um, we got it was all done through open source information, the use of Google Earth, and then we bought imagery from our usual commercial vendors. Um, we identified one location through open source information where it was possible that a reactor could be, could be placed. Um, you just narrow it down, there's an airfield, it's a reactor, a reactor needs a cooling system, cooling system needs water, so you narrow it down that way, and then, this was Paul I think, this location was identified. So then you start looking at it, and you start looking if it, you know, whether or not it has signatures that are consistent with, with, with what you know should be there at the open source level. So that's the building right beside the river. And then, I'm just gonna do this very quickly, but then we compared it to the Yongbyon 5 megawatt reactor and it was quite similar. So that's what you can do. Another example, this was my first job here at ISIS. Find laser enrichment in Iran. <laughs> so uh, I gathered all this open source information, narrowed it down to a certain location in Iran, and then started looking on Google Earth for anything that looked like had any sort of signature that was consistent with, with a plant of that type. So I stumbled upon this location. It was, uh, I don't know, 25 kilometers um, from Tehran. And um, I looked at it closely because um, it was away from the main city, not too far away. It was close to a main um, road. And it was at the same time quite isolated from anything else that was around it. It had that big building had a support area, and it had a water tower. So I started looking at it, but you have to look at it over time. So you go through a uh, timeline, and in 2013, this is what it looks like. It's tripled, support area has gotten a lot bigger. There's those two big buildings over there. So then you go back to the open source and you start looking for additional information. And I happen to find an image on the Iranian National Center of Laser Science and Technology website. And that's the image I found on the website. That image was taken from here. You have the big building. Look at the signatures. Building, corner, there's vegetation here, and there's a lamp here that you can't see because of the projector. There's a U-shaped building, and there's a water tower which is consistent with all of that. So that's when you're pretty sure that you're looking at the right location. Um, special materials enrichment plant. So 
Um, we found some information um, through an environmental uh, organization in India, in um, Karnataka. Uh, they had gone uh, to court to stop the development of a new area that was for enrichment and defense purposes. Um, so we um, got some information, uh, open, source, open source information through that. We knew that we were looking for approximately a 30 kilometer wall. It's hard to miss the 30 kilometer wall, that's pretty big. And we found it. Um, it took a long time. And we knew, well we had another, you know, other information such as, you know, in addition to the wall, we knew that um, another very important piece of information was that one of the, one of the areas of the site was going to be uh, given to DRDO for um, drone. It was going to be a drone testing center. So you find a wall and you see this. And I saw this and I was looking at that. We're like, okay, well, let's look at it in time. And that's what it looks like um, in April 2014. Um, this is, these are signatures consistent with a three. We knew we were looking for a 3.5 kilometer runway. That's information that you get open source wise. Um, so the acts that were given to the tribunal and stuff like that. And this is a wall that's developing. So just a close up, that's the test. That's the, uh, the drone part, yeah. So that was our work on India. We don't focus on drone testing facilities, but it's, it helped us find the location and that's where they're supposed to be constructing um, their new enrichment site. So that's it. <laughs>